audio and she's got me going. All right, good deal. <laughs> Almost a little over two weeks ago, uh, in our Sunday school class, our adult st Bible study, we looked at Standing Stones of Israel, part one. And I left you with a teaser, if you'll recall, but if you don't mind, because I know there's some people here that were not here that Sunday, I'm going to do just a small, quick refresher of what we did two and a half weeks ago. So, we will start. So, Standing Stones... We'll cover part two, but part one, but this is part two of Standing Stones. And I ended with this. This is the second temple, the house of God during the time of Jesus. The first temple, the house of God, built by Solomon. The house of God during the Exodus and before Solomon's temple. Tonight we will look into a house of God. Bet-El means house of God. Now in English and in our Bibles we see it as Bethel. And in Israel today you can find the city or the town of Bethel. There are also ancient remains of another city called Bethel in Hebrew. So, <clears throat> Bet means house of. So you could say Bet David, Bet Joseph, and they would all be house of whoever follows. El is short for Elohim. So this is the house of Elohim. Elohim. Elohim, the God Most High. So, <clears throat> the question is, if those were the houses of David that I just showed you, or the house of God that I just showed you, where was the house of God before the tabernacle? Was it in a place that we now call, or archaeologists call Temple Zero? Well, <clears throat> we'll do this quick review. You know, God gave the Israelites a very specific command. And in that command, he said this. Hopefully. Do not make idols or set up an image or a sacred stone for yourselves. And do not place a carved stone in your land to bow down before it. I am the Lord your God. Now, <clears throat> two weeks ago we covered Harad, where we went this past year in Israel. And when we were there, it was quite cold, and we did not get to spend the time that we wanted to. It was very windy. But uh, Harad is at the very southern edge of Israel, or at least the ancient times of Israel. Everything south of that is the Negev Desert, and nothing grows there. So Harad ended up being kind of the fortress that protected the country of Israel from invaders from the south. And so a fortress was built there, and this is a picture, an aerial picture of what is there right now. And <clears throat> At the very top of that is the Israelite fortress. But before there was a fortress, there was a Canaanite city that the ruins show and the archaeology data show goes back even to the time and before the time of Abraham. So that Canaanite city was quite large and it had been there for quite some time. And then um, the, when, when King David took over the throne, or sometime between King David and Saul, then the Israelites built this large fortress to protect the country. So in this area, and this is kind of what the ruins look like from above, and you can see that red squared area there, is a temple. And it is the only one of its kind that has been uncovered in Israel. And... 
I'm going to preface that to say it was the only one of its kind before 2010. In this area, you could see there's a, uh, highlighted in green, an area for an altar. And this is where sacrifices would have taken place. They would have taken the animals, the grain or oil, and would have poured that over this area, the altar. Then there's a second area that was most likely used to store grain or uh, oil and apparatuses that they need, you know, wood, things like that, for the altar. And then this area in red was the holy area, which was for the priests to hang out. And then you would have had a partition, and in the green area is what would be called the holy of holies. And this is the way this was all laid out. Now, <clears throat> the Lord told Moses, he said, Tell the Israelites this, You have seen for yourselves that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make any gods to be alongside me. Do not make for yourself gods of silver and gods of gold. So I think he's being pretty specific here, right? <laughs> he says, make an altar though, make an altar of earth for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your fellowship offerings, your sheep, your goats, and your cattle. Wherever I cause my name to be honored, I will come to you and bless you. Again, wherever I cause my name to be honored, I will come to you and bless you. If you make an altar of stones for me, do not build it with dressed stones, for you will defile it, or, and do not use a tool on it. And do not go up to my altar on steps, or your private parts may be exposed. So, <clears throat> in this Holy of Holies, that uh, last area that I showed you, this is what this looks like in this area. Now, I have two pictures there, one from that I took on March uh, of this year, and the other one is sometime around 1970. See, this was all unearthed starting at about 1966 for about a four-year period till about 1970. I'm not sure exactly when this right-side picture was taken, if it was taken uh, sometime after 1970, but this is what the area looked like after all of the excavation was done. And it was a huge find for the city of Israel or for the country of Israel uh, during the 1960s. And so this area is quite unique. First off, these areas that I've highlighted in green, those are incense holders. And so that's where they would burn the incense before they went into the Holy of Holies. The next thing you'll see, you'll see two stones. And these two stones uh, are kind of interesting because if you look in March 2020, how many stones are there? One. There's not two anymore. And I uh, found this quite unusual and uh, had to do a little research and asking around of why that is. But anyway, these two stones, to kind of give you an idea about these two stones... First of all, the stone on the right is not a carved stone in any way. It is in a natural state. And so that would, in this temple, represent Yahweh. And the other stone is a shaped stone. It is the stone of Asherah. Now, during the Israelites' time, there was a, a time when uh, before uh, uh, the second temple, as the first temple was, was being uh, uh, utilized, God said, you are to sacrifice and bring your sacrifices to the temple. But you know, that's a long way to travel, especially if you lived in Harad or lived in other places. And what people began to do was say, you know what, we can build our own place to sacrifice. We don't have to go to the temple. It would be a lot more convenient if it was here. And of course, as they started to do that, which was against what God had instructed, the Canaanites' gods began to become a part of the Holy of Holies. 
And so what you see here at the time when this was filled in is two stones, one for the god of Asherah, which was a Canaanite god of fertility, a female god, and then you had the male god, Yahweh, represented by the other stones. Now you've really messed up, because not only did you put a stone up, but you did exactly what I told you not to do, God said, by putting another stone beside me. And he did this. Now, you may wonder, why have they not found other sites like this? Well, I'll get to that in just a moment, but I want to show you one other thing that is very important here, and that is this pink area. It is called a bama. Not an Obama, just a bama, okay? All right, <clears throat> but it is just a, a slightly raised area for the stone to sit on. And so this is how they observe the Holy of Holies. Now, <clears throat> Here's what happened. In the time of Judah, or when Judah was a, a kingdom, Judah did evil in the sight and the eyes of the Lord. By the sins they committed, they stirred up his jealousy, jealous anger more than those who had before them had ever done. They also set up for themselves high places, sacred stones and Asherah poles on every high hill under every spreading tree. These were everywhere across the country of Judah and Israel. And people were worshiping these and taking their sacrifices to these type places instead of to the temple. And of course, this makes a jealous God very angry. So, <coughs> here's what happened. I don't know if you can see this timeline very well. I know it's small, but I'll make it a little bigger in just a moment. But... The Arad Fortress and the temple was made or constructed sometime around uh, King David and King uh, Solomon. So around 1000 BC, this area, this uh, Israelite fortress and temple became a, a place. And so it was... Uh, as they began to worship these places and became more prevalent throughout the land they had King Josiah who came and actually found the scrolls in the temple and they read them and they said man we're doing everything wrong so Josiah went out through the land and destroyed all the high places all the stones they destroyed everything like that and that's why to this day we cannot find anything like this except here and the archaeologist's theory on why this is, is was, this was a very elaborate temple. And it was at the very southern edge of Israel, some place that maybe Josiah's men didn't get to. Now, the one thing that they found unusual about this place is that it was filled with soft sand. It wasn't, you know, caved in. It wasn't from you know, earthquakes or, you know, things like that. It was literally filled in and left in the position that we saw it. Now, all of that, those two stones and the incense stands are not the originals. They are mock-ups. The originals are actually in the archives of uh, the museum in Israel uh, or, or in Jerusalem. So, but why was everything so pristine? Their theory is, is that they needed to get rid of the place, but instead of destroying it, they just filled it in. And they filled it in with soft dirt so they could get rid of it, hide it, but not destroy it. And this is the only one to date, or at least till 2010, that had been found. So <clears throat> the temple was filled sometime around 620 A.D., or B.C., excuse me. And then <clears throat> I'm going to put this up here, make it a little bit smaller, but I wanted to show you this timeline because I want you to see where the second temple came in. Here's where the second temple came into play. Here you had the first temple. During that time, now we're going to transpose a little bit and go the other direction, but here you had the second temple in green, the first temple during the time of David and Solomon, and the kings and then before that 
you had the tabernacle. And so <clears throat> that's what I want to look at for just a moment because that's one of God's houses. And we're going to start back with the tabernacle in Exodus and go forward just a moment. So here's your tabernacle. This is what a tabernacle looked like. And this is actually a uh, rendition of that in the Negev Desert uh, that the Israelites would have gone and worshipped at the tabernacle and had the priests go into this area to do their sacrifices. Now, the tabernacle contained the what? Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant. And <clears throat> it was a place where the congregation would gather outside that uh, courtyard area for Moses' announcements and things like that. This is where they would all come to gather to hear what God uh, had given Moses to tell the people. So <clears throat> that's where it started. And of course, it went through the 40 years in the desert. And then we find out in Joshua, the whole assembly of the Israelites gathered at Shiloh and set up a tent of meeting there. And Joshua then cast lots for them in Shiloh in the presence of the Lord. And there he distributed the land to the Israelites according to their tribal divisions. So we know that the Lord God was at the tabernacle in Shiloh as they divided up the lands between the tribes after they had come into the Jordan River and conquered uh, the land. So kind of give you a reference, there is Jerusalem, or at the time would have been a Jebusite fortress. And uh, Shiloh would be about 20 miles or 25 miles north of Jerusalem. And so this is where the tabernacle stayed for about 300 years. So the, God continued to live in what? A tent. That was God's house, a tent. Now, this is a picture of the area of Shiloh and some of the ruins of it. I didn't show you all the ruins, but it is quite extensive because remember, this is where all of the Israelites at that time, hundreds of thousands of Israelites would come and worship uh, at the tabernacle at least once a year. But this area is the area that they feel like is, uh, has the ruins of where the tabernacle would have been located through the time of Judges and all the way up through the time of Samuel. But here's what happened. Now the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. So the people sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubims. So what does it mean they came back for the tabernacle? Well, at the time, the Israelites were in a battle with the Philistines, and it was near um, the city of Appa, uh, of Aphek, and uh, anyway, that's where they were, and they were having this battle, and they were losing. What better way to get on the winning side is to get the ark in front of you, and that's what they did. So they went back to Shiloh, grabbed the ark, brought it back then to the battle, and lost the battle. The Philistines gained control of the ark. So uh, a great defeat of the Israelites at that time. Well, the Philistines then took it down to a place called Ashdod, and they put it into their temple, Dagon. And it sat there for a little while until they started having plagues and disease. Things were happening to them that were bad. And they said, we're not keeping this ark in our temple. So they sent it to their friends down in Gath. They said, here, guys, you take this and uh, see what you can do with it. Well, they didn't want to keep it very long, and they didn't. They sent it on to Ekron to some Philistines there. Well, they had heard what had happened, and they said, no, nah, we don't want that, so we are going to send it back to the Israelites at Beth Shemesh. So now it went back to the Israelites there, and even though it came to them, the Israelites had heard what had happened. They said, nah, we don't want this either. We're going to get rid of this and send it up north to uh, kareth Jerim. And the cart came to a field of Joshua at Beth Shemesh, and there it stopped beside a large rock. The people chopped up the wood of the cart and sacrificed the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. 
Then they sent messengers to the people of Kirith Jerem, saying, The Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. You guys come down and take it up to your town. <laughs> so they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent of David that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowshiped offerings before the Lord. So the tent then stayed, the tabernacle then stayed in that area for about 300 years. And then David, once he conquered the Jebusites, took it and brought the tabernacle uh, uh, and the Ark of the Covenant into the city of David. And so now it resides within the city of David. And <clears throat> this is a kind of a rendition of the city of David. And the tabernacle, they think, would most likely be in this area at the edge of the city closest to the spring of Gihon. And the reason for that is water was very important for the sacrifices for the priests to wash and so forth. So the tabernacle most likely would have been somewhere in this area. And again, what is it? A tent. It's a tent inside the city walls. And of course, David says what? Here I am living in a stone palace and my God is living in a tent. He wants to build a temple for him. God said no. And so he allows Solomon to build that. So you have the tabernacle for 480 years was the house of God. But where was the house of God before that? Well, For another 430 years, before the tabernacle, while the Israelites were in captivity in Egypt, what did they have? Did they have a house? What they had was no law. They didn't have a tabernacle. They didn't have a temple. What they had were promises. They had a covenant, the covenants that were made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's it. Now think about that for a moment. Because they had nothing to look at, nothing to read. There was no Bible. There were no scrolls. There was no Isaiah. There was no Deuteronomy. All they had were the promises, the covenants. Now... <clears throat> Let's pick up and see some standing stones in part two. So let's start with Abraham. In Genesis, Abraham traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to bear with me. I'm going to show you some maps. And this, is extremely, this was extremely difficult for me to understand. I am going to do my best to relay this to you. And <clears throat> let's pray I can do a good job. <laughs> let's pray God can reveal this to us. <laughs> so, <clears throat> if Abraham came down, this is when he's originally coming into Canaan, he stops... And from Damascus, he comes down. Can I get it to go? There he goes. It comes all the way down to Shechem. He is now in the land of Canaan. And right there at Shechem, from there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel, or Bethel, the house of God, and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Now, this is the question. For hundreds of years, from the time of the Crusaders, it was thought that Bethel and Ai were this area about 15 miles north of present-day Jerusalem. Salem. And we continued to think that all the way up into the 1800s. This was Bethel. There was Ai. So if Abram set his temple, I mean set his tent up, it was between Bethel and Ai. 
Look at the date on that map. 2005. We still believe that. Your Bibles will have Bethel and Ai in those positions. And guess what? There is a town named Bethel there today. There is some ruins of a fortress that they, is a Canaanite fortress that they attribute to the city of Ai. But we're in Abraham's time, Abram's time. We know the artifacts that were found at Bethel date back to the time of Joshua and no further. There is nothing to indicate that Abraham or Abram at the time stopped there. Of course, you wouldn't think there would be. It was just Abraham pitching a tent. So the question is, is that Abraham's Bethel and Ai? Well, <clears throat> things begin to change in 2010. Something was found that gave archaeologists a different vision of where Bethel and Ai were during the time of Abraham. Where is that? In Salem. Present-day Jerusalem. That is Abram's Bethel and Ai. You see, he says, on the west is the house of God, on the east is Ai. So I made a little bit of a topograph. I didn't make it. The Smithsonian made it. But I tried to mark out here, and I hope you can see that. But <coughs> Bethel, the area circled in blue, if you can see that, is where the city of David was. And that is uh, just south of where the traditional old city of Jerusalem is today. But next to that, and down at the bottom of the Gihon, uh, or the Kidron Valley, is the Gihon Springs. The most important thing in ancient times, in the Holy Land area, was what? Water. This is the only place for two days' walk that you can find water. So, was there a house of God there? Because it says that Abram pitched his tent here between Bethel and a place called Ai. Well, here's what's happening. In the last 10 years, they are uncovering a Canaanite city just to the south on the hill, or just to the south of the uh, Mount of Olives, on that hill up there. We don't know if it's Ai, but it is a Canaanite city that dates back to the time before Abraham and up through Abraham. Now, we didn't have that information 10 years ago. This says, then he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Now, it doesn't say Abram named this place Bethel, did he? He said it was already there. He camped to the east of it. So, if that's the case, let's assume that Bethel, which was called Luz at that time for, Abraham, for Abrams, and there's an Ai up on the hill to his east. If this is what we know now in 2010, in Genesis 14, we have a new perception of what Abram is saying. Because if Bethel and Ai were not there during Abraham's time, this is what would be the known area for Abram. See, when he traveled, he traveled from Bethel south to Hebron. And there is where he set up his household when he first got in to Canaan. So that changes the perspective a little bit. Now, in Genesis 14, it says, After Abram returned from defeating Condalamar and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh. That is the king's valley. Now, <clears throat> this is after Abraham had gone up and saved Lot 
Lot came, or Abraham came back down, and he came back down to a place called the King's Valley. And the king of Sodom, over by where we see the Dead Sea today, came over to meet him. But why at the King's Valley? And where is the King's Valley? Let's go back to this map. You can see that here is the King's Valley. It's what we call the Kidron Valley today. They met by the Gihon Springs is where they were. Now, <clears throat> if this is where they met, then we have a new picture. Okay? So Abram's initial journey brought him, let me get this to go here. There we go. Maybe, yeah. All right, there's Bethel and Ai for Abram. The old Bethel that's in Joshua's time is not there. So, from what we know since 2010, we know that Abraham, when he went north, he went back through that area. If he'd have went anywhere east of there, there was no water. If he'd have went anywhere west of there, there would have been no water for his trip. Most likely, he went through the Kidron Valley or the King's Valley, going up to save Lot. And then when he comes and saves Lot, he comes back down and stops to meet the king of Sodom. But the very next verse says this, Then Melchizedek, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. Now, Melech of Melchizedek means king, and Zedek is righteousness. So this is the king of righteousness. Now, in Jewish law, a king cannot be a priest. A priest cannot be a king. But yet, Melchizedek is called the king of righteousness. He's also later on in the Bible called the prince, or um, excuse me, the king, the, the priest. Later on, but how could he be both? Well, some people think that Melchizedek was a pre-incarnation of Christ. I will tell you, I do not think that. I think this was just a man who had an intimate relationship with God, who was a priest of God Most High, and he had a house of God where he worshipped. And that's why Abraham said that the house of God was right there to his west. So, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies, this is Melchizedek telling this to Abraham, delivered the enemies into your hand. Then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything he had. How many times has Abraham been in, through there? Would you give 10% of what you have if you just met somebody once? I wouldn't. I don't think Abraham would either. Abraham had a relationship with Melchizedek. He knew he was a priest. He knew he was somebody special to the God Most High. And there was a house of God, a Bethel, there at the Kidron Valley at the Gihon Springs. When they had reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on an altar on the top of wood. Now, he lived down in Hebron at the time. He walks up, or actually lives in Beersheba at the time, Beersheba. It's about a two-day walk through this area where you get water and then go up to what most theologians think that Mount Moriah is where Abraham made this sacrifice uh, of Isaac. And so he would have walked right by God's house through the Valley of the Kings 
right by Melchizedek. So, <coughs> this was the area that is now considered the temple area, the temple mound, but at the time, it's the top of Mount Moriah. So Jacob, let's jump to Jacob for a moment, left Beersheba and, sent out for, and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, the Lord said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land which you are lying. This is the first time this is used. What does he tell Abraham and Isaac? I'm going to give you the land that you see. I'm going to give you the land before you. Here, he says, where you lie, I'm going to give to your descendants. Two thousand ten. We're still thinking Bethel is up north, and that's where Abraham and Jacob, uh, and that's that's they literally have a place marked where Jacob supposedly uh, laid down and saw the, and had the vision of the stairwell or the stairway. But that has changed since 2010. All of that is gone, and now this is Jacob's house of God. You see, he would have come from Beersheba up through Hebron to Salem on his way north, number one, to escape Esau, number two, to go find a wife. Because his mom said, go up here to your relatives and find a wife up there. And he stops at a certain place. No place else to stop that has water. It's a good place to stop. So, could this be Temple Zero? This is what, what it would have looked like, say, after the flood, up through the time of Abraham. It just looked like a mountain with a nice area that came to a point with two valleys on either side of it with a spring gushing, literally gushing, because that's what Gihon means, gush. It was gushing out of the ground. <clears throat> and during the time of David, this would have been the Jebusite village. It would have looked like this. They would have protected the Gihon spring where it gushed out of the ground. Let's go back to what it would have looked like during the time of Abraham. You see, Archaeologists since 18, or actually it was found in 1866 by uh, uh, an English archaeologist that came and wanted to look and, ex and look at the Temple Mound. He wanted to excavate that. Muslims said no. So he went someplace else. And he started digging around and looking around and found a cave, a cave complex. Whoops, did that not go? Okay. A cave complex, and at just above the Gihon Springs, they found caves and evidence of dwellings there that dated back before Abraham after the flood. So they know a small group of people lived in this area. <coughs> now, that's about all that's been found over the last few years. They've started uncovering what was the city of David. See, up until, especially during the time of the Crusaders, the old city of Jerusalem was Zion. That was the city of David. It did not change until 1866 when this excavation started. And they said, maybe there's something more here. And they began to look more and more and look at the ruins around there. And then after Israel became a nation, they really began to excavate that area and found what almost every archaeologist believes today is the city of David that was in that area that I just showed you. But before that, people lived in this area at the time of Abraham in caves and in small dwellings. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the city of David. 
And this is what they thought it was, this area that's outlined in blue, for years, all the way up until the mid-1800s. In reality, the city of David is in this area and encompassed the Gihon Springs. And this was all discovered by Charles Warren, who, thanks to the Queen of England, sent him to find this information out. But we are going to concentrate on this little red area for the next five minutes. This little red area is just outside the city of David. See, when Jacob woke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. He was afraid and he said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. See, when Jacob woke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the Bethel. This is the gate of heaven. Now see, this is when Jacob was coming back. He had his family, he had all his entourage, all of the things that he had gained when he was working for his father-in-law, had his two wives, had 11 sons, all kinds of things, and he stopped right back at the exact same place when he was going north. This is the gate of heaven. Could this be a gate of heaven that is behind this iron gate that was discovered in 2010? You see, early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and he set it up as a pillar and he poured oil on top of it and he called that place Bethel. Though the city used to be called Luz. You want to see what's behind the gate? That's behind the gate. This was uncovered in the latter part of 2009, and they've continued this excavation <coughs> extensively over the last four or five years. This is a standing stone just north of the Gihon Springs that has been covered for what looks like more than 3,000 years. It's also been looked at. When, whenever Jacob put these stones up, the tradition, this is not in the Bible, but Jewish tradition says that you stood the stone up and you set smaller stones around it. Jewish tradition says there were 12 stones around Jacob's stone that he set up as a pillar. There appears to be 12 stones fused together around this stone. They also have evidence that oil was used and poured over the top of this stone and has gathered around that stone. And they can date this back more than 3,500 years. Things changed in 2010. Standing stones in Hebrew are called matsevas. With the remnants of the olive oil that is soaked into the rock, with it stood up as a pillar in an area that was called the house of God. Minds are beginning to change. Archaeologists' minds and Jewish rabbis' minds are beginning to change that this is the original house of God. See, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, I will and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And all that you give me, I will give a tenth. 
And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be the house of God, Bethel. And all that you give me, I will give a tenth. This is what they have uncovered. And right now, this is what we see in, or what we can see in the city of David. You and I cannot go there. This is off limits. It's locked up. It is very controversial because this could change where the third temple could be. But you see the Metzava in the second room? They found a grain press with markings, probably where they set tables. Those were legs that uh, tables set in. There's a raised platform like the Bama that we saw in the temple before. It has channels where the liquids and the blood would drain. There's an oil, I mean, an olive press nearby and a grain press. All of this gives people, gives archaeologists the thinking that this is Jacob's Metzaba. This is a drawing of what this area may have looked like. During the time of King David, King David would have built this so that he could possibly use this as a place of worship before there was a temple. What was David to do? Maybe the tabernacle was just on the other side. See, this is all carved out into bedrock. This is an artist's rendition of what it may have looked like during the time of King David. You can see his palace there at the upper right. And here could be Temple Zero. After Jacob married Le- Leah and Rachel, and he decided to return to the land of his father, Isaac's, his wife, children, and his entire household, stopped at a certain place. Jacob and all the people with him came to Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. There he built an altar, and he called the place El Bethel, Elohim, be it Elohim. Because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. God said to him, your name is Jacob. But you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. Jacob set up a stone pillar at the place where God had talked with him. And he poured out a drink offering on it. And he poured oil on it. Jacob called the place where God had talked with him. Bethel. The house of God. See, Israel's stones were not meant to be worshipped. They were not meant to to be put up on an altar or a bama. Israel's stones were nothing more than a representative of the covenant Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had with God. On Mount Sinai, God was very specific to have no idols, no carved stones, shaped metal or carved wood. There was to be no man-made object to represent the Elohim. Before the covenant inside the ark, there was an initial covenant, a covenant before the ark of the covenant, before the tabernacle, before the first temple, before the second temple. Was there a house of God maintained by a priest and a king of Salem, Melchizedek? Was there a temple zero? The covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were standing stones, not to be worshipped. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant 
which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This is our new covenant. Jesus says he is not going to drink from that fruit of the vine. He has not drank from that fruit since that night that he did this at the Last Supper. He is waiting until you and I, those that believe in Jesus Christ, those that believe that he rose from the dead three days later, he is waiting to drink from that cup when we are in his presence. That is our covenant. Thank you. Mm -hmm.